to them. And uh, so where's the book at? Where did I put the book at? Uh, oh, there it is. Right here. Well, I finished reading the book I've been reading. It was given to me as a birthday present. I just came to the jazz concert over things. Uh, but I'm not talking about music. I'm talking about uh, just the other quotes. I support the guys. This is one non-alcoholic. This is a, a pineapple ginger, the guy said. Try that right now. Wet my whistle. Hmm. Put on my other light so I can see from I'm reading. Hmm. Ooh, I'm into ginger. I'll leave this right there. Um, I got this book last year, for my birthday last year, which is in July. Um, uh, for happy birthday, birthday Anthony, uh, I always, uh, uh, I always wish to, I always, well, then she gave me this book, this old book, and it's, uh, called, uh, that's from, um, a Kenyan friend of mine at the University of uh, Fort Hare, South Africa. Uh, in black and white, the untold story of Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens by Donald McRae. Interesting enough, Donald McRae is a South African. Oh, white South African boy, whatever. Hmm. It must be English because I noticed somewhere in the book he used the word color, but it's spelled the English way. C O L U D, something, you know, L O U D. So I'm going to go through this entire book, so be not be patient, be whatever. I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting new reading, I'm getting reading glasses from the VA, but I'm not going to wear any glasses back because I have to read. Um, after I have to read, read this. So when I go through books now, I usually never marked up a no dog ear books, nothing like that, you think. But now lately when the book is mine, I've been doing these things where, like see right here, it's the first mark. I mark the side here, so I'm going to read, I'm going to go through all the marks and read what this is. Uh, first one, O.B. Um, Keeler's report in the Atlantic Journal tune, uh, turned into a lament. Joe Lewis is a heavyweight champion of the world, and so far as the correspondents can see, there is nothing to be done about it. Okay, this is from uh, the first, I guess it's the first chapter, chapter one, the race. Uh, the late dated July 4th, interesting enough, I'm born July 3rd, uh, uh, 1938. I'll do about it. Our fastest runners are colored boys, and our longest jumpers and our highest jumpers. No, that's a, that's a quote. In the, daily, in the Chicago Daily News, uh, Hugh S. Johnson tried to answer Keeler. And there's nothing for us to weep about. And, and seek white hopes. These black boys are Americans, a whole lot more distinctly so than, and more, and more recently, than more recently arrived citizens of, say, the smelling type. Talk about German type. There should be just, um, there should be uh, just as much pride in their progress and prowess, prowess under our system as in the triumph of any other Americans. For all their misfortunes and shortcomings, they are our people, Negroes, yes, but our Negroes. Talking about both uh, um, Joe Lewis, who just, who just won the champ, uh, a championship, and uh, Jesse Owens, the runner. They were, they were born um, about uh, two years apart in the same region of the South, um, that Alabama area. Uh, so let's keep on going through this book. Like I said, I highlighted some things. So I'm just going to go through the highlights. Uh, it's, it's an excellent book, by the way. Really, really good. Another highlight here. I don't know why I put this one. I guess that first one was about um, about uh, Joe Lewis. I think this one was about Jesse. Um, uh, Dave loved the fact that the prodigious leap uh, against a Notre Dame, a university which barred black students. Okay, uh, uh, Dave was one of um, Jesse Owens' um, uh, teammates, and uh, I think that's what it, what it was here. Yeah, I can't find his whole name here. Sorry about that. Um, because let me go. Let me go right before the sentence. Before on May 11th, 
he had become the first American jump to jump over 26 feet, leaving him a quarter inch short of the uh, world mark held by Japan's uh, Chuhai uh, Nambu. Dave loved the fact that uh, the prestigious jump came against Notre Dame because they were in uh, school together in Ohio. Uh, it's a team leading Ohio on the track team. Uh, so let's keep on going. See where I put my next mark. Uh, let's see. Oh, hold on, wait, before I get to the next mark, this is very important. Uh, up into the, uh, um, Joe Lewis is the second heavy black heavyweight champion, I guess, of the world. First one was um, the one who just got pardoned by, not just, but a couple of years ago got pardoned by Donald Trump. Jack Johnson. But Jack Johnson, like a lot of other people these days, he was very flashy, <laughs> running around with underage white girls across the state lines. Anyway, he was a trip. But Joe Lewis' crew, his crew, let me show you his crew. This also was the first time he had a crew. This is his crew here, all black men. It was the first time, uh, when I say crew, his entourage, you know, his boxing, people that did, did the whole boxing, the immediate boxing crew, they were all, they were all black. Now this is important, but what's more important, not this, just that they were all black, but one of them was actually, um, back then, uh, um, uh, in your crew, you always had a gangster because it's since the 30s, you know, the gangsters, you know, took over boxing or whatever it is. And um, whether they're Irish or, or, or Italian gangsters, they, they control it. One of the gangsters um, who, uh, who owned the Cotton Club, um, no, he wanted in on, 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 on Joe Lewis's entourage. Uh, but one of the Joe Lewis entourage, I forget which one it was, I think it was, uh, maybe it was um, either John Roxbury or Jack Blackburn, one of those guys. He was a gangster too from Detroit. So uh, somebody uh, obviously in, the, in that world owed him a favor. So he called that guy as soon as they left that meeting with that, that cotton club guy who, won, who's won, who, was, who laid out his ultimatum. He called this guy in Detroit. The guy in Detroit called the guy. And basically, the, uh, the, the, the cotton club guy said, oh, okay, no, hands off. But because of the legacy of, of uh, Jack Johnson, they had um, these rules. Or, or rock, the, the, it was called the Roxbury Commandments. Were, print, uh, were, were printed uh, um, by delighted newspapers. When they had, there were seven, um, seven commandments. One, Joe Lewis would never have his picture taken alongside a white woman. Two, he will never go into a nightclub alone. Three, there will be no soft fights. Four, there will be no fixed fights. Five, there will never, uh, he will never gloat over a fallen opponent. Okay, six, he will never Oh, I'm sorry. He will keep deadpan in front of the camera. That's why you'll see Joe Lewis with this, like, solemn, you know, whatever face like that. And Jesse was always smiling. Number seven, he will live and fight clean. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Oh, oh here's some more. Here's another. Oh, where's that? that? I just missed it. Where is it? That? Where is it? That? I thought I saw another one of my marks. Maybe I didn't see another one of my marks. Okay. Uh, it, it's an excellent book. It's very well written. Well, here it goes. Very well written. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know I enjoyed it took because I took a long time reading it. That's what I do when I really like a book. I take my time. I slow up. Um, let me do some of this computer for just a second. Let me keep something up there. Um, uh, Heimlich Himmler, one of Hitler's highly educated deputies, argued that intellect rots the character on May 10th, 1933, at the university and city squares across Germany. Hundreds of thousands of books were burned on bonfires. Interesting. He was a highly educated and he wanted to burn books. I wonder why he wanted to do that. Hmm. This pineapple ginger is really good. I like it. Um, isn't it always the case, you know? I mean, like, I'm not one to tell people not to go to college or anything like that. 
mm-hmm. Bible say don't go to college, but I, I would I couldn't tell somebody not to go because I did go. You know, do graduate, you know, undergraduate degree and all that stuff. Uh, let me come and keep on going through my through my thing. Um, they, they have all these pictures here, very good pictures, you know. Oh, here's uh, Dave um, Albritton was the guy uh, from, on his team, Jesse on Dave Albritton, and Mel Walker from the Ohio, uh, from his Ohio team. I guess it's Ohio State University. Okay. And they were always sharp dressers, you know. Here's that picture from the cover. But they were sharp dressers like that. They were friends for life, really. Uh, let me keep going here. See if I find my next mark. Uh, I need to go through this with you because it's not only a good book. There's some lessons to be learned with these, uh, with these, uh, with these things, with these books. Oh, well, before I get to that, there was something. I know there was something I'm missing here. There's a mark that I know I put down. That's the hello one. The one. Mm. Oh, here it is, right before the Himmler one. That December, Lewis made history by becoming the first black man to be voted America's Athlete of the Year. In an annual poll of the country's newspaper writers, Owens uh, be- uh, came third with um, Ulysses P- uh, Peacock two places behind him. Even the fact that, that, the, that the three uh, that three out of America's top five athletes, Alabama, Alabama Negroes, uh, could not uh, mask the stark truth. The Tuskegee Institute in Alabama confirmed that 20 Americans had been lynched in 1935, five more than the previous year. So every time, this is the story, every time, even when Jack Johnson had won the title, you know, they were, uh, you know, they were like lynchings, lynch, they went crazy, these uh, black people drive white people crazy, you know. Anyway, so, you know, the, there's always a reaction when there's some sort of black achievement. Uh, I guess there still is, in a weird um, sort of way. There still is a, a reactions to that. Um, I made a note here. Um, uh, uh, Snyder guessed that Avery Bundage, Avery Bundage, this is a name you should know. This is racist to call. Back then, you know, people like Avery Bundage, um, that, that guy who took over the... Um, uh, from, from after, after, um, I forgot his name, after, uh, the, the, the um, when they, the, the whole, the alcohol thing, when they legalize alcohol again. And, um, he made marijuana illegal. Um, uh, he's a racist to the court. He was like a racist racist. And, um, no, 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 J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover was weird because... He was like a self-hating uh, homosexual and black person. He had blackness in it. He had black spook around the ears, we call it. And he was homosexual. And he, that's the two groups he hated the most, you know. Anyway, uh, guess that Avery Bundy, then the AAU president, um, the, he was the AAU president, and his deputy, Daniel Ferris, were behind the idea of barnstorming across Europe after the snow boys, after Jesse Owens had won the, um, had won the Olympics. They didn't get a break. They were then basically slaves to, Bun- to, to uh, Avery Bundes, who was head of the AAU, you know, uh, amateur athletes or, or union, I guess what it was. And because they were running out of money, and they took the athletes and made them go all over Europe to make money for the AAU. Terrible. And Bundes, to, you know, and, and, oh man, just, I don't even go into what all Bundes did in terms of um, the, the racism, the naked racism that nobody would do. Uh, here's a thing I had right here. It was his own fault. He hadn't trained. Oh, he hadn't listened to Chappie. Chappie was part of his group, right? He hadn't shown any respect. He thought he could just turn up and smelling would fall at his feet. He called him smelling. Uh, it ain't ever. It ain't ever gonna happen again. He told himself. And and uh, Braddock and the title would come first, and then the best of all. He would go. He would uh, he would be smelling going after uh, um, uh, Max Smelling. Uh, he had to make Max a uh, hateful thing, but this is the same thing that that didn't have Mike Mike Tyson. You know, Mike Tyson read his book. You know, when um, when Buster Douglas beat him, it's because Mike didn't take him seriously. He was like partying or whatever have you. Da, da, da. But that's what happened with um, with Joe Lewis. He was up there partying. You know, people coming up to the camp, charging people to see the camp. You know, 
literally thousands of at least two thousand people come and he was making money off of that and all that stuff but he didn't take some of that seriously he was smells up upstate new york too like you know really working out so those things happen okay i'm gonna keep going see my next little note i don't make a lot of these notes i usually leave mental notes you know something i figure if it's that important it'll stay in my brain because you know hey just, just the way I is. Um, you know, a, a lot of stuff. Like I don't even like to take pictures of really worthy things. Oh, here's something here. Uh, Big Lou was already lost. As I sat there and the handlers fussed over me. Oh, he. This was a a, a fight that uh, Joe Lewis had. I sat there and the handlers fussed over me. He admitted later. I was thinking that I had got hit with the most uh, beautiful punch I had ever seen. I could feel everything in Joe's body behind that punch, right from the toes up. Wasn't that odd? I got hit by Joe, and I sat there like a painter, admiring the fine work of another painter. With the bell, um, then the bell rang, and we were uh, on our feet. And added again, the champion painter splattered me over the canvas with the six in the six. Nova simply beamed through his concussion. After the fight, he described himself as a student of the Far East metaphysics, metaphysics and Hindu spirituality. The brown bomber was unmoved. I don't like all that mysterious, you know, uh, stuff. He muttered. So it's interesting because if you the way you fight, you think with boxing, boxers, you know, they appreciate each other. They, they may have respect for each other. It's just that, even be friends, but it's just that when you finally get in the ring with somebody, well, then it's total combat. You know, it's, it's a very interesting, it's like, I guess, any sport, any kind of competition, let's put it that way. Uh, let's keep going here. Soldier Blue, you know, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Joe Lewis, you know, went into the Army even though he couldn't, well, he could have been exempt, but he went into the army and did his, and did his patriotic duty. Oh. Soon after, just another thing right here. Soon after, uh, soon after they arrived in Chicago. Oh, this is interesting. Soon after they arrived in Chicago, Ruth. This was Duke talking about Jesse Owens now. Just Jesse, Jesse Owens' wife, Ruth, had her first real jolt. She had been shielded by her immersion in what she called a nice and clean life. Chicago taught her how little she knew. When they were out in the functions, the, the brazen Chicago women shocked and frightened her. They acted as if she did not even exist, as if they saw Jesse as just another guy to be hunted down. It was as if she was surrounded by a city full of um, Quinsella uh, Nicholsons, uh, the Hollywood dead, uh, with the dumb name who had tried to steal Jesse just before they were married in the summer of 1935. Interestingly enough. Um, so that, that's what wives have to go through, you know, when, you, when you're a celebrity, you're famous, you know, pe people don't care, I mean, not just women, but men don't, you know, they go, they just don't care, you know, it's like you belong, you don't, you no longer belong to yourself or your family, you belong to, well, you belong to celebrity, and people don't really sign up, they say people sign up for that, that's what, but I don't, I don't really uh, go for that, let's see right here. Oh, here's a Richard, I didn't know this, but I came across, I just was, you know, Richard Wright uh, wrote uh, wrote this song. Uh, Count Basie did the music and Richard Wright did, this, did the words. Um, it was King Joe part one and, and two. I looked it up on YouTube and sure enough, it was right there. Um, so this, I have this thing with Richard Wright. I'm a sort of a weirdly Richard Wright scholar. It's like Richard Wright and Henry Dumas are my two, my two writers, you know, if you want to. Put it that way, but when Joe Lewis, there was another thing that I did have marked in. I can't find it right now. But when Joe Lewis first was boxing, Richard, Richard Wright, um, did, he was writing for a Chicago paper, and he he had uh, wrote uh, this thing about uh, what what happened when he when when uh, when Smelling was uh, was defeated uh, that first that first time. Uh, in Chicago, um, it was a really eloquent piece. He, he did basically just uh, uh, describe how uh, what happened in the streets, you know, how people just turned out and they just man, it was a uh, it's eloquent writing. Too bad I don't have that here. And I don't know where I, why I don't I didn't 
the market. Um, but it was a uh, it's, it's an amazing piece of writing when you when you look at it. Um, Oh well, I guess it will. I just have to stay in my memory. Or you just have to, have to get the book and see where, and see what that that writing was. It's when he beat Smelling for that second time. Um, oh, too bad I can't find it. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's uh, Richard Wright also did another song uh, with I think Paul Robeson sang the song. Um, I think this even this song that Paul Robeson sang this song. Yeah, Paul Robeson sang this uh, um, uh, King Joe Part One. Uh, there's this. Uh, let me keep going. See what else I marked in the book. Uh, there's a train. I'm taking a train tomorrow. Oh, Uncle Tom Blues. Um, now, uh, Martin Luther King wrote this book, Why We Can't Wait, 1964. In fact, the next thing ADOS with um, Yvette Cornell's book, I uh, think it's going to be, uh, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, Chaos or Community? And that's a, um, a Martin Luther King Jr. book, but um, uh, Martin Luther King, but it's written by Coretta Scott King, interestingly enough. And I guess that should be my next book. I should join that book thing, but I don't know. I have to wait till I get to St. Louis. I don't know what I'm going to what I'm going to read next. Um, I might take a break and read something light. I don't know. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me read this thing, Uncle Tom. This is chapter, chapter 16, Uncle Tom Blues. This is interesting. Uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King writes in 1964 in this book, Why We Can't Wait. More, more than 25 years ago, one of the southern states adopted a new method of capital punishment. Poison gas uh, uh, supplanted the gallows. It was in its early stages. The microphone was placed inside the sealed chamber so that the scientists, uh, scientific observers, uh, might hear the words of the dying prisoner to judge how the human reacted to this novel situation. Scientists, so-called scientists, white scientists, whatever. I'm sorry to say, white scientists in general. The first victim was a young Negro, of course. I'm saying, of course. As the pellet dropped into the container, the, the gas curled upwards and through the microphone came the words, Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. Save me, Joe Lewis. Interesting enough, enough uh, three is one of those numbers, and he said it three times. Wow. That's powerful. Um, so I think that's the, I don't think I, I, I marked much more. I've come to, oh, here, let me see. Um, uh, just, I said, you can take it to, oh, uh, Jesse, Jesse Owens would do these tours, you know, I want to go into the whole thing with the, with this 1968, 68 Olympics and, and the, and the whole thing that went on with that, with John Carlos and John Smith and, hmm. uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, uh, with the, with the whole club thing, you, that's, that's history, you can be that, you can be that, but, um, but Jesse was was against that, you know, that whole um, um, demonstration and stuff like that. A little known thing about that demonstration: that the Olympic Committee and people got so mad that the boxes came the last thing. And George Foreman was one of those people that gave the, the box these little American flags, and they would trounce out with the American flags and do the bow, whatever have you. They tried to thwart that whole thing that that uh, that Smith and and and, and, uh, and Carlos did. Anyway, so he, so Jesse would give these speeches all over the country. He's like a motivational speaker, I guess. And one day he said, um, uh, Jesse would, would, churn, would churn out the same line he had used over and over again. You can take it. Just, I guess he was talking to, um, let me see, let me go back. Uh, he had forgotten how many hundreds of times uh, he had used the example of his friend whenever he brushed up against another despairing man or angry kid who told him, I can't take it no more. I've just had it with this country. Uh, Jesse would churn out the same line he had used over and over again. You can take it. Just a little, lo just a little longer. Look at Joe Lewis. Lu uh, Joe's been taking it more longer than anyone, and he's still the greatest man you'll ever meet. Joe ain't about to quit. Why should you? So, you know, you, you use those celebrities, you know, um, well, to do the, to do the, to do the thing. You know, just like they, things haven't changed. Anyway, so, I, um, so that's it. I, I, um, did I, I, I purposely, 
usually when I'm reading like this, oh yeah, there's an epilogue called Memento. So I purposely haven't read these pages and I'm not going to read it for quite a while. I usually wait, wait, wait. It's just like a, the story's over. They both died within two years of each other, like they were, they were born within two years of, of each other. And um, it's a complete story. It's a very good book. I suggest you do read it. If you can, it's really, it, it, especially if you're in athletics or celebrity, it's a really good book to read. But one, one lasting thought I have, there was a somebody, um, oh man, I forget who it is, I think it's a YouTuber, had said something, or somebody said something like this. I, I often wonder why we really hold Malcolm X so reverently. And what I realized, and it's just like, like Barack Obama put this up, in, well, whatever. Let me know there's some, I won't get into that. But Malcolm is the only one that didn't, as, as, as leaders, so-called leaders go and politicians go, now I guess there's other politicians, but leaders, especially have leaders of large movements go, that didn't, um, didn't trip out on his wife and his family, you see? All these other leaders, all of them, every single one of them had mistresses and whatever have you. So they could be, by, they could be blackmailed or whatever it is. They were, I want to say, they lost their principles doing that, which is quite interesting um, because to really be a complete leader in terms of that kind of thing, I guess you have to have principles all the way through in all, as I guess nearly fully would say, in all areas of activity. You have to be principled in all area, all nine areas of activity. So, uh, so, so, and that thought came to my mind reading this because both of them had problems with, uh, you know, flashiness. And, uh, and women, uh, or, or or bring bring a, a good at what they did, but then the balance, no, well not the balance, but the opposite thing is they it's like, you know, they would do the opposite thing as far as you know betraying things. So 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 people could fall to to a point, but then you can always find a flaw. Okay, so that's what I got out of this. Uh, thank you for listening. This is a very long thing, but it was a it's a very good read. Get it if you can. Uh, Donald McCray. Um, it's really excellent book. Um, in Black and White, The Untold Story of Joe Lewis and Jesse Owen, basically their friendship. Don McCray spelled M-C-R-A-E. And uh, I guess it's some sort of award-winning book, too. That's it for me. T, from the Patterson's Taking the Train to Spec, letting you know what I only suspect from a reality of the A-D-O-S. <laughs>